for the NLP is linguistics, which means it's for language. And that's this, I call it the stuff in the middle, like in a sandwich, it's the meat in the middle that's most important. Now the techniques, those are like uh, combinations of the skills. Uh, and I'll explain some of that. So neuro-linguistic programming, neuro for our brain. And that also includes, by the way, neurochemistry, which most people don't teach. It's part of NLP. Second part is linguistics, and that's about language and programming. That's about how we organize our thoughts inside our brain. So those, that's what the three letters mean, NLP, neurolinguistic programming, and that's what those three things in the, in, the, in the words mean. Now, you have the skills, and then you have the techniques. Again, and the techniques are the combination of skills. Let me explain that. A lot of places will teach a lot of techniques, but they don't teach the skills. That's a big problem, and that's a big mistake because it's like this. If I teach you how to make, let's say a bake a chocolate cake, that's a technique. You're gonna make the best chocolate cake of anybody because I taught you how to make that chocolate cake. But if somebody comes to you and says, oh, you know what? I want a, I want a, uh, 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 I want a pineapple upside down cake. You're not gonna know what to do because I didn't teach you that technique. And the other part of the problem is that the techniques work every single time until the first time they don't. And I can promise you there's going to come a time when the technique doesn't work. And then if you, but if you have a level of skills, then you can know what to do next. That's the most important part about this NLP thing. So if I teach you about baking, I teach you about ingredients, temperature, humidity, even elevation, because there's different elevations, different, different baking things, they, they act differently at different elevations in the planet. If I teach you all of that, you can still make the best chocolate cake. And if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want you to make me an upside down pineapple upside down cake, you can do it. Because you know how all the ingredients and everything works and the temperature and the humidity and all this timing. So that's the, that's the big difference between what we do and what, I don't know, I don't know how to explain what other people do. I know people have asked the question, what's the difference between the Society of NLP, and I'm not going to name other organizations, but I'm, I'm going to answer that question, because I know that question is out there anyway. And uh, we've been around since 1978. We started it all, okay? And I, I can make that very simple and very clear. The Society of NLP has been around since 1978, and that was with Richard Bandler and John Grinder. Okay, later on, in the early 1980s, they split up. No big deal. They just decided to go their own separate ways because they they were they were they were worked they get worked together really well, you know what they what they put together was uh, was great, um, but they weren't the kind of friends that they hung out together and they went and had a drink together or they went and had a picnic together. They weren't those kind of friends. I have friends like this, you know. We're friends. We get along. Uh, we could do some things, but we're not we're not going to have a barbecue together. You know, we're just we're just not that kind of friends. I mean, I have a lot of those. And so then John and Richard, they went their separate ways. So, but we've been around forever. All these other people, all these other trainers, and I want to make this clear to everybody. I have trained with almost every single major player out there, okay, in my days. I've been around doing this for, I'm going to say probably, let me say at least over 30 years. I don't know how many over 30, maybe 32, 35, something like that. I've trained with just about everybody. I trained with Robert Diltz. I trained with Derek Robbie. I've trained with, you know, Wyatt Woods. I've trained with all these different people. I've trained with Tad James. I know them all. I know these people from the early days. I know where they got some of their material from. So, but the fact is, we've managed to stay out there and we've got the best people out there on the planet. There's no joke about it. Okay. Here, uh, the difference is we've been around the longest and we do everything we can to maintain the quality of the Society of NLP Trainers trainings. And we also do whatever we can to support our trainers. You know, I, I got people ask me the question, you know, like sometimes they'll say, let me, let me put it this way. So I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing this webinar for you, for Muhammad. Okay. Yeah. Now I've had people ask me, oh, can you do a webinar for me? Can you do a webinar for me? And I put my trainers first. Richard puts his trainers first. We do this to support our trainers. Okay. This is what we do. So we've been around the longest. As far as I'm concerned, everybody else is a Me Too product. They've changed things around. Some places have even added stuff in that's not even NLP. You can't, 
You can't put put Reiki in with an NLP seminar because it's different. Yes. You can you, but the best thing to do is you can use NLP to make your Reiki better. You know, and then they got all these other things they throw in there. It's not NLP. They're, I've been around for a long time. Richard and John, when they developed the basic skills of NLP, there are no new skills. They hit it. They got it. They got they got it all covered. You know, and uh, you know you can come up with a new technique, but the fact of the matter is that there's no new skills. So somebody would say to me, oh, I have a new technique. And I go, okay, what is it? And you know what it's a combination of? Anchoring. And I say, so, so, <laughs> so you use the common, a, a, a different combination of anchoring. So instead of anchoring you on the arm, you anchor the guy on the nose, big deal. But it's still anchoring and you want to call it the, the, the touch the nose technique. All right, great, that's just great. But they're, they're all a combination of the basic NLP skills as developed by Richard and John, period. There's, there's no new technique, new names for things because people think they want to put a new name to something, therefore to get different attention. They haven't created anything really new except for the name. The best NLP trainers that I know, they demonstrate what they teach. If, they, if, you're, if you go to somebody else and that trainer cannot demonstrate what they teach and you went to the wrong place, I don't even know what to tell you. And that includes for my trainers as well. You know, everybody's not perfect, but everybody's still learning a lot of things. I'm still learning a lot of things. And that's another part of what we do. You know, I don't think I know everything. People say, oh, you're a master trainer. You must know everything. I go, nah, I don't know everything. Now, I'm still learning a lot from Richard, by the way, you know. But just so everybody knows, I have trained with lots of other people and not just with Richard. I go back to about 1982, maybe, or 83, somewhere around there when I really started, okay? So those are the big differences here. Uh, so if anybody still has a question about that, I, yes. I can't imagine what it could be, but go ahead. Uh, okay, John, which links me to the next question, which is because I was going to ask you a little bit later, but I think this is time now sure. to ask this question, sure. Go ahead. which is sure. uh, how do they know, how do they find out a good NLP trainer uh, uh, and uh, how does, how is the, what is the place? I mean, I know the answers, but of course coming from you will be better that uh, what trainers would you recommend in this part of the world and how to find a good trainer? Well, you know, over, over, over in uh, your part of the world, there's, there's probably a few, you know, you know, society trainers, you know, as far as I know, I really don't know. Uh, how do you know if they're good? Listen, as far as I'm concerned, regardless of what they claim, ask to see their certificate. Okay, and as far as I'm concerned, if it doesn't have Richard Bandler's signature and my signature and a society seal on it, I'd pass them up. That doesn't mean there aren't other good people out there, but it really means can they back up what they teach? You know, if they can't back up what they teach, I'd be careful that they demonstrate what they teach. You know, if you wanted to look up trainers, you can go to, uh, um, uh, let's see, society, let me see, society dash NLP dash dot, uh, uh, let me see, society of NLP, yeah. uh, society dash NLP dot net. And there's a search. Okay, you can look up search. You can go to any country. You can search by country if you want. You want to search a name and see if they're in the database, you go search a name. You know, I got in Singapore, I got a Stuart Tan right there. He's, he's, I see him online here. So if you went and looked up in Singapore, you'd see Stuart's name. Okay. Um, I got other people, you know, from different parts of the world. If you went and looked up uh, Orlando Zucchetti, you'd find Orlando Zucchetti there because he's one of my great trainers. Okay. So if they want to know who I think are the best trainers, there are trainers, of course. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. Okay. Um, okay, John. Uh there's a, there are two specific industry questions uh, before I move on to Stuart sure. and Orlando questions. Uh, one is uh, from the banking industry. And sure. these, are, uh, these are questions from three different bankers that how can NLP help us, our juniors and our senior colleagues in banking in se uh, sector? This is from the banking and then I'll go to the HR one after this. Sure. Uh, let me say first, it doesn't matter what the industry is. I don't care if you're in banking. I don't care if you're a taxi driver. Okay, everybody's got a brain and all those brains work the same way. Now, they might have different belief structures. They might have different things about that, but it doesn't matter to me what industry people are in. But when they say, how can you help your junior and, you know, help with what? What is it they want help with? You know, give me an example of something so that I can at least address it that way. Sure. Great. Now, next one is, uh, again, Wait, it's, it's give a... Me an example. Do they, does the person have an example um, let's see, uh, did, did someone have an example like of, about what they would want help in the banking industry? What's the help they would want? 
yeah i i don't know there's he's not actually mentioned anything on that uh, but uh, he is uh, no he's not mentioned anything yet i'm waiting for him let him let him okay. get okay. back okay. Go to the get next that. question yeah next is uh, related to the hr that uh, the question is that is nlp a better tool to use in the hr practices or uh, the science of body language <laughs> NL, nlp nlp can be used anywhere someone has a brain there's only two requirements. One is, do they have a brain? Two is that they want to learn to use it. This is not about using NLP in any certain context. To really learn how to, how to utilize NLP, because it's, it's about your brain. You have, to, you have to practice the skills, because you want it to become part of something you do every day. I hear people say, not, not, not just in Pakistan at this time, I mean, I hear this from different people around the world. Well, I use my NLP on my job, but I don't use it at home. And I have to tell you, I, I find that a little bit crazy myself because I'm thinking the first place I would want to use it would be at home, you know, because it's all about your language, both verbal and nonverbal language. And how do you use the tools? How do you use your skills? See, some people are natural at this. You know, they don't have to learn NLP. You know, they're, they're great at getting results. The bottom line to me, is if you're getting good results, you're doing all what you're doing well, you know? So it's not about using it in any one industry. I have people who are doctors, lawyers. Unfortunately, some politicians probably will not learn NLP so they can be more influential and more persuasive. But it's really about your, your brain. Um, so it doesn't matter to me who the person is. You know, we've all got a brain. They all operate the same way. Well, different languages, we got different beliefs, we got different backgrounds, we got different growing up, all those things. But that doesn't change the way when you're born, we all have the same brain, the same kind of brain. It's right there. Now, what do we do to it? What do we do? How do we educate the brain? How do we program it? Because that's what education is. You grew up in one neighborhood. I grew up in a different neighborhood. So we have those things in our brain. But before all of that happened, we all have the same brain. So NLP is really about learning to use your brain both with language and nonverbal language to become more elegant, how to maybe change some things around in your mind. You know, if you don't like something that you're doing, how can you change it? Um, I see a guy here said, how to achieve and sustain mindset of a millionaire using NLP who is in debt presently. Yeah. Well, there's a whole science about that actually, you know, and, and that's a good, I mean, it's the same kind of a thing. You want, you want to use it for that. But first thing you have to do is let me, let me just say, answer a couple other questions that I know are out there somewhere because I know some had to do with the coronavirus thing. Yes. Yeah, I, <laughs> I know. Was that. Yeah, that's right. They got, listen, you guys out there, have, you know, get, you got great questions. They really are great questions. Um, somebody asked me the other day, they said, well, what's the one technique? Um, okay, I see somebody else has a good, has something good too. It's all about using uh, NLP in, um, in Urdu, in, in the Urdu language. Um, I'll get to that in a second. So, so the idea is, is that, uh, if you're if you're stuck at home, I don't know how it is in Pakistan. Are you are you all, all like in quarantine and things like that? Yeah, uh, we okay. were we were sort of. Sort of. Okay, fair enough. Uh, you know, I, I would still be protected anyway. I'd be careful out there because you don't know. You know, people said, well, you know, this Corona thing. I don't know if I believe it. I don't know if I don't believe it. Listen, people are getting sick. People are dying. Uh, well, I'm not going to argue with how many. We're not going to argue with the statistics. I'm not going to argue with all that. But the fact is, they do not have any idea how this spreads. So that's, that's the part that I go, I protect myself. You know, I have an appointment this morning. I told you, you, you know that. So I have to yeah. go, I get out of here. You know what? I'm going to wear my mask, you know? And if I go certain places, I'm going to wear gloves. Uh, am I afraid of catching it? No, but I'm going to wear them anyway, because I just don't know. Now, so people said the other day, I was on another uh, webinar and, and, the, and one person asked how, what's the one NLP technique that I could use tomorrow to get, Ex excellent results. And they didn't like my answer so much because it's not necessarily an NLP technique, although it's part of a strategy you can use. I said, first thing you should do is get off your butt and do something. <laughs> instead, of, instead of sitting there worrying, thinking about the worst things, being in a state of fear, because in a state of fear, you're not making really good neurochemicals. You're not making good neurochemistry. We already know that. And, and it prevents you from thinking things like that. I said, get off your butt, get out of your pajamas, get dressed, you know, put on regular clothes, uh, get on the internet, go look at some interesting things. If you can go out and go for a walk, get out and go for a walk. 
Put together some videos. Go on, go put them on the internet for your friends and your family. Make funny things. You have children, make videos of your children doing silly things and you helping them do silly things and you're being silly with them. You know, so to me, this is a this is a good opportunity if you're stuck, if you're stuck in the in the in the home pretty much, you know. Uh, it's a good opportunity to get to know your kids, your children even better, you know, get to know your spouse better. Come on, you got to live with them. You're living with them, you know. Uh, is it is it is it challenging? Of course, it's challenging. Um, Kathleen and I, you know, we stay home. We don't we don't go out much unless we're traveling to do seminars and things. So we're kind of used to this anyway. And as a married couple, by the way, we're in business together, okay, and we get along great. So it's all a matter of you know, can you put some things aside? You're gonna nobody's perfect. You got to know that nobody's perfect. So, but these are good times. They're not just challenging times. These are actually good times for opportunities. But you got to get off your butt and do things, not just sit there and worry. You know, there are lots of opportunities out there. It's amazing. You know, I tell people, get out of your, get out of your pajamas, get out of your lounging clothes, you know, put your, put your trousers, ladies, you know, if you wear makeup, go ahead and put your makeup on. So what? Go ahead and do it. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's fine. And by the way, I think women look great without makeup. You know, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think women really should be putting all that makeup on a little bit is okay, but I think it's fine, you know, most women. And some of the women, some of the women are worried now because they say, well, now you can see my gray hair. You're worried about gray hair? Look at this. How about you worry about this? <laughs> now, look at this. My hair. I'm not that old. So, but who cares? If you're going to worry about your hair because your, your spouse is saying, oh my gosh, you're worried your spouse is not going to like you anymore or love you anymore because your hair's is, you see your grays. He's known the grays are there the whole time because you go get, the, get it all fixed up from time to time. But so what? If that's the most important thing to your spouse, uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I have other questions about that. But uh, yeah, this, this is a serious thing going on. But you know what? It's also a good, good opportunity. Yeah, that's, uh, that's absolutely right, John. Uh, John, one of the questions which is here on the forum from one of our own, my students and an NLP practitioner uh, working in Dubai, Yasser. He says, how is NLP different from other sciences? That, because this is a question he's been asked. So that exists to date on mental health, psychology, and brain sciences. Well, there's a few different things. Number one was we're not a science. And, uh, and uh, we, we, you know, NLP is based on models. So you explain, explain this one. Let me explain this one. What happens is this. If we can get the result, then it works really well. You know, I'm not going to knock any other, any other, any of the other sciences. I'm not going to say anything negative about them. I, I could say that you know, most psychology is based on theories. We don't have theories. We have models, and it's based on helping the person get the result. There's no scientific data that proves NLP. That's because people are so subjective that the, the success of getting the result is dependent upon the operator, the practitioner. Um, some of the brain sciences are good. You know, if, if they're if they're valid, you know, neurochemical, you know, a whole lot of things going on right now with neuroscience. But we've been teaching about neuroscience for years now. Um, people say, oh, you're catching up to neuroscience. And actually, neuroscience is catching up to us in terms of what we can do. You know, we've said for years, uh, you know, even with medication, and most doctors would say this, as far as I know anyway, is that, you know, we give the medication out to people. Now, there's some good things. Uh, penicillin is good. That, 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 that goes into your body and finds the bad guys and kills them, basically. Um, but the other, all the other medications, if, if you would, those things adjust your neurochemistry. But the fact is, if we could teach you, and we do, we do this in seminars, if we could teach you to feel good for no reason at all, then my question is, do you still need the medication? Because as far as I know, and according to any doctor I've ever asked, and I asked them publicly in class, I say, are you a doctor? Yes, I'm a doctor. So you wouldn't mind answering a few questions. Hey, not at all. Go ahead. I go, is it true that the medication doesn't really do very much except it sends signals to the brain to tell the brain what to do next? And they go, yeah, that's true. But I said, well, it doesn't cure anything. They say, no, it doesn't cure anything. So that tells me that the medication, I asked my doctor one time, I said, doc, you give medication to people for different, you know, they want to feel better. They don't want to be depressed, all these things. He goes, yeah. He said, why do you give him the medication? Because he knows what I do. He laughs every time when I go in. You know, he says, oh my gosh, what are you up to now? What are you, <laughs> what are you trying out now in your seminars? And I said to him, why do you give the medication when you know that people can learn to use their own brain and may not need the medication? He said, oh, 
I gave you the medication, John, because it's easier. He's, he's being honest with you. He said, it's easier. People aren't going to take the time to go learn to use their brain and spend the time to use their brain and practice these things that you're doing. Uh, I give him a pill. It's going to help him out. And that's okay. That's, that's okay with me because I'm a doctor and that's what I do. So we've had more people learn to use their brain and not have to use medication. We don't ask them to stop, by the way. We tell them they must, must, must be staying in touch with their doctor if they're on medication. You know, it's not a, there's no reason to come off all on your own. You got to be very careful about this. So I leave it up to the person, but if they come and learn to use their brain, then, then they, they, you know, people are happier, I man. That's all there is to it. They're happier. They have less concerns. Does that mean they don't have problems? No, problems happen every day. Count on that. There's going to be a problem every day going to pop up in your life. I got problems every day. People, people email me, trainers. Oh, I don't know what to do about this. Like, okay, well, no, they do. And, and that's fair. And I say, okay, well, how about the, here's some alternatives. Here's some choices. I'm not going to make a choice for you. You know, most people, they don't know how to make a good decision. You know, they make decisions. They're used to making decisions. They think they've learned to make decisions. But, you know, even with NLP, we can teach people to make better decisions. You know, it's, it's that simple. I, I hate to say NLP is easy to learn because it is easy to learn. It seems complicated to people, but we don't want to, we don't want to make things complicated. I think people make things complicated on their own. On their own. So, Ab absolutely right, John. And uh, some of the guys who have just joined, uh, just I want to thank once again, John Lavelle, President of the Society of NLP to give time for the first time, I guess, in Pakistan and this part of the world. And, and that is the commitment that society and John and Richard have, uh, you know, for helping out their trainers. Uh, and uh, as you all know that in Pakistan, uh, it's we are only two uh, licensed NLP trainers from the society, Kamran, uh, who's my, my, my mentor and my trainer as well, Kamran Sultan, John's, one of yep. John's favorite uh, trainers, I guess. Uh, and then I'm the second one. So thanks once again, John, and uh, I'll move to the next question after sure. this thanking ceremony. Uh, I give challenges using the linguistic, I have challenges using the linguistic part in other languages like Urdu. This is a question from Ibrahim. Um, sure. uh, although, uh, I mean, I think you'll, you'll answer this better than I can. Because you, sure. you deal with Japanese, you deal with Italians. This is just Urdu. Sure. Italians are listening. Sure. All the languages are different. Now, I tell people the following thing. First of all, some of the, some of the, Almost everything in the English language is going to work in your language with a few exceptions. You know, some of those are might be the ambiguities, you know, like uh, in some in some countries like uh, they don't have a in language models, they don't have a syntactic ambiguity that, that forms really well. However, I've given this advice over and over and over again. I think it might even be in the book Persuasion Engineering. I'm not sure if it's in the book or not now because that was back in 95 or six. But I tell people. Write out these patterns. If you speak English, write these patterns out in English first, because your brain, you know, you, if, if you have more than one language, the easiest one to do these in is because NLP was first developed in American English, not even British English for that matter, although we have the same structure. Another language that has a very close structure to American English, believe it or not, is Danish. So they learn, yeah, so they learn English very fast, or they have anyway, you know, at least in the past. Now, if you do these exercises, so you write out ambiguities, you write out the language patterns, write them out in English, because what that's going to do is that's going to, that's going to change your brain around a little bit, because here's what happens. So you have your language, I don't, I don't even know if this is true or not <laughs> about locations. So you have, you, you have, what is it, Urdu? Urdu? Yeah, Urdu. Urdu. So you have that language is over here. And maybe your English is over here someplace, you know? So, so some people have to make a, a, a switch to get over there. However, if you do it in English and you write out patterns, because especially the ambiguities, if you're familiar with the ambiguities, um, what happens then is that you, you start to build a form, a structure of humor. That's, that's important, okay? And, and humor is very different than telling jokes, okay? I've been telling, you know, telling jokes is pokes fun at people, classes of people, sexes, races, you know, all this stuff. So I'm not talking about telling jokes. I'm talking about humor. So, and, and, and if you understand English, so for example, um, uh, when my, my, my dad passed away uh, probably about 20 years ago. And here's an example of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, an ambiguity. And uh, my mom was sitting home by herself like this, you know, in a house, not going out, just sitting there. 
And I was at the house one day and I said, mom, what are you doing? And she said to me, she said, well, you know, she goes, ever since I lost your father, I said, whoa, stop. I said, you haven't lost him. You know exactly where he is for the first time in your life. Now, that's an ambiguity. I don't know if it works in Urdu, but I know it works in English. Now, mom, now, mom, by the way, here's what happened, okay? So, and I'm going to difference now. So for those of you who are keeping track of the language, you have what's going on in the conscious mind and you have what's going on in the unconscious mind. Let me explain what the difference is so everybody has good understanding. Conscious is what you are aware of at any time. Unconscious is what you're not aware of at any time. I'll give you a, a real clean example. Right now, probably none of you are thinking about what your feet feel like right now, except now you are because I mentioned it. But your brain is keeping track of how your feet feel, especially if you have them in shoes or, or in sandals or whatever, but you weren't keeping track of that. Now you are because I mentioned it. So that was comes from your unconscious. Now I bring it into your consciousness. That's the only difference. So I keep track of what's going on unconsciously. So when I said that to my mom, ready? She said to me, that's not funny. And I'm an Italian, so I got what we call an Italian, a scapolota. So she, she hits me in the head. She goes, that's not funny. As she's laughing. The laughing part was the unconscious part. She didn't, couldn't control that. And that's what I wanted. I wanted my mom to laugh about my father having passed away. So I used an ambiguity to do that. When she said, oh, ever since I lost your father, I said, actually, you haven't lost him. You know exactly where he is for the first time in your life. And she did, and she laughed. So practicing these ambiguities, what it does is, are you ready? It starts to form a sense of humor because ambiguities in, in language, and I'm sure you have them in your own language. I go through this with the Germans. I go through this with the Japanese. I go through this with the Spanish. I go through this with all of them. So what happens then is when you build a sense of humor because ambiguities what they do is when you hear an ambiguity, you're not sure where it's going to go to first. You know, there's other ambiguities like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Groucho Marx was good at some of these back in the good old days. You know, he said, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. Now, who was in whose pajamas, you know? Then he changes it at the end. He says, well, how he got there, I'll never know. But everybody always laughs at that, and it's a simple ambiguity. Okay? So, so when you do that, it, 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 what it does is your brain does a search in the back to find out what the meaning of that could be, but it, it hits as many as it can. When it does that, you laugh. I don't know what makes it makes you laugh, but it makes you laugh. That means you're forming a sense of humor. And since you've got to go and search in different places in your brain to make, to make sense of it, it starts to strengthen. Are you ready? It starts to strengthen the corpus callosum, which, okay, which is the part that covers both sides of your brain and communication goes on better and better and better between both sides of your brain. You know what that means? It means now you have more flexibility. So you could practice the patterns in English, make them funny, make them humorous. And that will start to strengthen this business. And then you'll be start to be able to connect parts of your brain faster, easier. You know, that's it's a really very simple exercise. This is not this is not very difficult to do. It takes a little time. No, absolutely, John. Uh, this is and this is something which I Definitely teach a lot in because when Kamran and me, we are teaching in Urdu uh, NLP, we use these kind of examples. For example, one of my uncles, he came to my grandmother. Uh, both of them have, uh, uh, have died by now. But when he came to my mother and he said in Urdu, he said, and I will say the sentence in Urdu just uh, for the audience to understand. Sure. Me, mere se train guzar gai. And he basically what he said was that the train went over me. And uh, my, my grandmother got really, you know, worried. Show me what happened, what happened, where, where, where. And he actually was passing under the bridge. So he said, yeah, when I went under the bridge, the train went over me. So he used that <laughs> ambiguity to create that. Right. And, right. and yeah, that's right. Um, uh, by the way, uh, guys who are listening uh, today, of whoever is there today, uh, I'll be announcing my NLP practitioner from 22nd to 28th of June. And you'll have a special gift from my side uh, because of John's presence here. So we'll be discussing it in the end. Uh, John, uh, next question is from how can we use NLP to change behavior in relationships and one practice that we should practice daily to strengthen our uh, skills in sales and negotiation? Okay, let me do the first question first. So that's about how can we change, change, what is it in relationships, change what? 
yeah, change behavior in relationship but others are not ready to change so what can we do to change them oh oh, oh okay because i was going to say whose behavior do you want to change yours or the other person's no, no the other person the okay other. not happen absolutely well because unless the other person wants to change their behavior the only way i know of having another person change their behavior is for me to change my behavior first in relationship to them absolutely now, now there's sometimes you know if the per, let's say the person has a they're on, on their own they just have a negative behavior uh you know from from very long time ago my first question is why did you get into a relationship with them you know, but the other part is if they don't want to change, then you're wasting your time. That's first part. Second thing is I never work with relatives, family, or close friends. I send them to somebody else, you know, and then, and then, and then, and because we, we, number one, I'm not going to be involved because there's too much history going on. You know, I might know too much about your history. So I, that might interfere with my thinking about how to use my NLP skills. And I don't want to do that. So I don't do, I don't have, if you, if you're an NLP practitioner um, and you want to change, let's say your partner's behavior, they have to want to do it, but I still wouldn't do what I would send them to somebody else myself. You know, Richard does it. Richard does the same thing. You know, Richard has a, has a very good, I don't know if he still has the guy, if he knows where he, where he is, but had, had a really great friend. And the guy, the guy was agoraphobic, which means he doesn't leave his house. He's a fantastic engineer. He's got a lot of money. So he doesn't have to leave his house. He has all his meals delivered to him and he would make certain special electronic things for Richard. And someone asked Richard one day, they said, why don't you just, why don't you fix it? Maybe why don't you just fix his agoraphobia? And Richard said, well, cause he's happy and he doesn't want to fix it. So who am I to decide? There's a big problem in NLP. People think, oh, now I can go change people. No, no, it's not. If they don't want to change, good luck to you, you know? And so, and I respected Richard a lot for that because he said, no, no, I know the guy. I've asked him one time, you want to do something about this agoraphobia? He said, no, I'm happy. I, have, I like staying home. I don't leave the house. I have all my meals delivered. I'm good. I earn a good living here, blah, blah, blah. Um, and Richard said, great. The guy's happy. He's making money. He doesn't want to go out anyway. He doesn't want to interact with other people. Who says he has to, you know? Yeah. He says, so why do I want to change all that? You know, for all I know, I could help him leave his house and then he's going to go out and be miserable because you're going to meet people that are nasty and rotten and they don't like him or, they're, you, know, for, you know, misbehaving and all this stuff. So why would I want to do that for the guy? The guy is happy. Why would I want to change him? Absolutely. And then uh, uh, one practice that you would recommend, especially in sales and negotiation. Well, there's a whole lot of things. I mean, I could spend. I could spend I know, that's days. your favorite area. <laughs> yeah, I know. I could spend. Well. It's about persuasion and influence anyway, not just in sales and everything else. Yeah. Um, it's not. It's not. It's not just about that. that. There's a whole lot. There's a whole lot around per persuading people and doing sales and things like that. Uh, one of the things is. One of the things is, don't work so hard to trying to sell somebody something. You got to get them to be willing to buy what you want. That's really the secret right there. When I'm when I'm when I'm working a sale, if I'm working with a potential customer, my I, my best idea is to get the person to want to beg me to sell it to them. Okay, please, please, please. Where do I sign up? Wait, 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 wait. How can I buy this? Wait, wait, can I get it? How soon can I have this? That's what I, that's what I want them to do. Sometimes people, they, they, they try all kinds of tricks, you know, and they think there's language patterns or all that. That's only part of it, but you don't have to do all of that. If anybody, I don't think anybody from around that I'm looking at here has, been, has spoken my, to Kathleen, my wife, on the telephone. But if she, if you, if you, I, if you, I have, I have, I have, <laughs> if you've spent time with Kathleen on a, like some people call and they go, Oh, I'm interested in the seminar. You know, we do them in Orlando and in, in other places. So I'm interested in the Orlando seminar. So what, you know, what can you tell me? She doesn't sell them. She doesn't sell them. Okay. She starts talking about things. She starts talking about how she's found the usefulness for it, how much she, she enjoys doing it. She tells them a couple of stories about how she's been able to close some sales or how she's been able to be more persuasive in some situations. She doesn't try to sell them anything. Her enthusiasm sells more than any technique I could ever teach her. So it's, it's a lot about that. My first thing to tell people is if you don't believe in what you're selling, go sell something else. 
that's 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 real that's really a big part of it you got to believe in what you're what you're selling whether it's a product or a service that's number one and the second thing is i see too many people going into a sales situation and what they have is they have their powerpoint thing you know they bring in their powerpoint they want to show it to the customer and you want my opinion about that that's stupid you know why because you have no idea about the person you just want to shove your product in their face and that's not going to do it necessarily either matter of fact I can tell you, I know a guy who went in and did, I went with him because he wanted me to, to see how he was, you know, how was he selling? Cause he wanted to increase his sales. I know why he wanted to increase his sales once I got in there. So I went in, like I was his, I was an assistant. Like I was learning from him, things like that. And uh, so he gets up, he introduces himself, tells the guy I'm his apprentice. He's teaching me, blah, blah, blah. Then he says, hold on. He shuts the guy's office lights out. And he projects a PowerPoint presentation on the guy's screen that was in his office. This went on for about, I don't know, a long time, five, six, seven, eight minutes, which is a long time for me. Before I heard the following. <laughs> and when I looked over there, there's the customer like this. Trying to stay awake. So the problem is they don't ask enough questions. You know, you've got to get enough questions. Forget your PowerPoint thing. Your PowerPoint thing is designed to convince them of your product. You don't even know how they want to buy just yet. I saw a guy almost lose, again, I was with him, okay, with two guys, me and two guys. They almost lost a Nike account. Wow. Okay, right. They, a Nike account. They almost lost a Nike account, all right? Guy because they didn't pay attention. Finally, I got them to pay attention because I basically took over the sale for them. I said to them, oh, well, what these guys, uh, yeah, guys, hold, hold on, give me a second, give me a second. And I just took over because I didn't want these guys to lose the, the Nike account because they weren't paying attention to the customer. It's that simple. You got to get to know the customer first. Um, those are the things in, in sales and persuasion and, and, and business and things like that. I, I would go in, you know, for real quick techniques. I would just go in and tell somebody, wow, thank you so much for giving me the time. Uh, I want to know a little bit about your business. Tell me about your business. How did it get started? And just sit back. They're going to give you lots and lots of information. Okay. And that information is, is very, it's golden. Take little notes on, I take notes on a postcard. I don't take, I don't bring an iPad out. I never do that. I don't like them. I think it's, I think it's, 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 uh, Maybe in a younger generation, it's acceptable. I don't know. But the older generation, I use little postcards. I just start, jot down you know, notes on it, the key points they're making. They'll start telling you about how their great-great-grandfather, there you go, how their great-great-grandfather started the business. And you go, you're kidding. Wow. What? Tell me about your great-great-grandfather. They will tell you loads and loads of stuff. Remember, they're telling you a lot about them as well as what they're telling you about their great-great-grandfather. And then you get to ask more questions. You build a good level of rapport with that point, and you get to do you get to get much more valuable information. Now you know how better to present your information to them, and you may not even have to. Example is that Italy. If you go, well, if you go to Italy, and you're going to be a potential customer, rule one: you never bring up the business. You go out for lunch. You do not bring up the business. You sit. You have a meal. You enjoy each other. You talk about the families. You talk about the flowers. You talk about the weather. When they're ready, they bring up the business. You go to Germany. You sit down. You talk about the business. Then we'll go have lunch. Okay? So you have to know these things. You have to, you have to understand what's, what you're going into. Um, I had a friend of mine who was a film producer. And this was great. And he, he had a chance to go to... Um, I was one of the uh, Middle East countries. I forget if it was, I don't know if it was Pakistan or Hawaii. Iran. I, I don't know which, which country it was, but he spoke about how, number one, he had to get permission from the government to even go there because he was doing a documentary on some, some, some guy. And uh, they said, sure. And they actually gave him uh, some government people to stay with him to make sure he didn't mess around out there or whatever. And he got to go on this, I don't know the road. He got to go on this road, which was a private road. Um, it was owned by a bunch of families or tribes or whatever. And there was very little speaking. And, and he would sit with them. They were very kind, very gentle, very nice people. And uh, if they had to stay overnight, you know, they put up tents or whatever and things and they, they'd make sure he was comfortable. And there was very little speaking. And he would be thinking in his mind without saying anything, be thinking, 
I'm, I'm thirsty. I'm kind of thirsty. You know, I don't know. Well, how do I ask for something to drink? And they would just turn around and give them something to drink. I think that's important to know. Things like this go on. Even if, even if he thought Jim getting kind of hungry, you know, I don't know. I just get something to eat. I don't know. They would, they would take out food and start serving up food for him. They just, they just knew. I don't know if it was by watching him, calibrating him, or was it even telepathically mental? I don't know. Okay. But he would that, imagine this now. He, he's, he was going out to do this documentary about this one person. He fell in love with these people because of the way they treated him. They made it clear that they were more very interested in him and been basically just taking care of him. Not even they weren't even asking him any questions or anything. So there's there's a there's a gem right there about getting to know your customers, getting to know your customers in a way that's very, very useful for them and to you. That's that's very important if you're going to do business with people, if you're going to do sales or whatever it is. Absolutely. And, and, and I think uh, one of the techniques that I probably suggest a lot of my students is calibration. I tell them, hone your skills of calibration because that's where you will be able to uh, observe uh, better. Uh, John, I wanted to move to the next question from Hafiz Anwar. But yeah. before that, since you mentioned persuasion a couple of times, so uh, there was a question linked to it. What is the difference between persuasion engineering, DHE and NLP? So if you can, please. Okay, so okay, so let me start from NLP. NLP is the basic technology. It's the basis of all the skills. Okay, and 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 when NLP was first developed, it had was primarily developed to to solve people's problems. You know, overcome issues and things like that. It was really it, it dealt more with what we would call remedial work. You know, fix helping fix problems up. Design human engineering. That's about something totally different. All right, but it still encompasses the basic skills of NLP. So DHE is about building all new tools inside your brain. My wife likes to call it, she says, that's how you do interior decorating inside your brain. Now you got to remember a couple of things. Um, as we developed then a DHE, we started developing probably around 89. Okay. And it didn't really become out there very well until about early 90s, maybe, maybe 92, something like that. So it's about building, building new ideas and, 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 and enhancing whatever you have in your brain. So for example, um, you sell homes, I'm gonna say, you sell homes, right? And somebody wants to know what's the square footage. So typically people take out a tape measure, they measure it, or they have these, uh, they have these uh, uh, infrared things, you know, they, they, they just tells you what the you know, distance is and all that. Well, if you, if you remember about Nikolai Tesla, Tesla would, what he would do is he would build, he would build machines in his head and then he'd build them on the outside. Okay. You remember something, you probably heard the term that, you know, the, uh, the map is not the territory. Yes. Well, I changed that around a little bit We're for DHE, but the territory is the map. That chair you're sitting on right now didn't just appear. It started here and then somebody created it out here. Well, this is what Tesla did. And Tesla, he would get the machine running and he'd get the machine running inside his head and he could measure the wear and tear in his head. And then he'd measure it on the outside and it was precise. So he'd measure the machine outside, what was the wear and tear? And it was precise. So this guy, this guy was amazing. So, but it's the same thing. So if you can measure a room with, a, with an infrared like this, you know, can you be, can you walk in and go, 14 foot, three inches or meters or whatever you want, just by looking at it. And then because you're, you're good at it and you built something in your brain that enables you to measure the distance in a room, just like that. Richard was walking through the hotel one time, going into the seminar, we we're doing DHE. And someone decided to ask Richard, they looked at him and they said, so Richard, what's the height of the ceiling? Richard went 10 foot, six inches and walked inside. And then the person measured it and it was 10 foot, six inches. So DHE is about building new ideas, new, new things in your brain. It's also about, you know, shortening your, your strategies a little bit. So you don't have to think, you know, run, run through such a long strategy to do things. Persuasion engineering now is that's actually a combination of all of those things. So it's got the basic skills in it and it's got some DHE in it. As a matter of fact, uh, when I came up with the term, when I came up with the name persuasion engineering, we were actually going to be doing a seminar in Canada. 
and the, the seminar was about sales, business and sales. And just before we started, you know, I'm in the room with Richard, we're on stage. And uh, Richard says, we're going to open the doors in a second. I said, okay, good. He said, what, what, what seminar are we doing here anyway? I said, well, because he had the seminar called Patterns of Persuasion. And then we had DHE. And I was also, also writing a book. And I said to him, I said, listen, since this is part of Patterns of Persuasion and NLP and Design Human Engineering, I said, why don't we call it Persuasion Engineering? And he said, cool, open the door. And we, we announced it the first time in Canada. We said, welcome to Persuasion Engineering. <laughs> So those are, the th those are the three basic differences, you know. It doesn't have everything in it from DHE. You know, in DHE, we teach you to build control panels inside your mind so you can control your brain better, you know, things like this. Uh, so those are the three differences. And up there's, we, we, we include all, if you came to Persuasion Engineering, we're going to spend some time teaching you some of the very basic level NLP skills, rapport, you know, uh, representational systems, I access and cues. We're going to teach all the anchoring. We're going to teach you all the basic skills. And then we teach you how to put those into different combinations. So same thing with design human engineering. You know, we always cover. Um, that's why we tell people, you want to come to one of those seminars, there's really no experience necessary because we're going to teach you the basic skills you're going to need in order to do the rest of the seminar. We do that anyway. So. Great. Um, next question is from Hafiz Anwar. He's asking how could NLP, uh, how NLP could work in making ourselves better human beings, happiness and contentment. I believe the core objectives one want to achieve and spread around. We how we may include inculcate it around using NLP. Well, I got to tell you, being a better human being, being that goes right to the core of your development and your being. So if you're not a good human being, you got you got work to do. Let me just say that. Um, I mean, there were a couple of things. I, I guess NLP is NLP is not is not the be all that ends all. Okay, um, you know your your whole attitude about things. You know uh, your attitude about life. Your attitude about how you approach people. Your attitude about how you handle difficulties and problems and things like that. You've got to you've got to really you've got to really pay attention to how what's the effect you're getting to people. You know, with people, are you getting results with people or not? Do people like being with you? You know, there's a couple of things I can watch, you know, about people. When I was doing job interviewing, uh, one example is I would, um, I would take people to a restaurant because um, I wanted to find out how they treated other people. That's a very important element. If I can observe how you treat other people, that can tell me a lot about you. All right. You know, I was with Richard many, many years ago first, and, and uh, we got into a taxi cab. And in the taxi cab was a wallet that someone left behind, okay? Now, the taxi cab driver didn't know who the person was because it was a taxi cab. And Richard took the wallet and he said to the, he said to the taxi guy, he said, hold on a second, just, just wait a second. And Richard went back into the hotel and gave the wallet to the front desk, okay? First thing he did was he opened it up and he took a picture of the license, okay? He said, listen, I don't have time for this. Can you please find this person? Because they just got dropped off here. They left their wallet in a taxi cab. Now, Richard didn't look through the wallet to see if there was money. He didn't look through it to see if there was credit cards, you know, none of those things. So how you treat other people is important. So I would do the following. First of all, um, I, would, I would drive with the person. I'm going to go on a job interview. So I'm going interview, to interview this person for a company, say, because you know, that's what I, I, I would do sometimes. And so I would say to the person, why don't we have lunch? And they go, okay. And I go, tell, tell you what, you pick me up at my office. I got this great restaurant we'll go to. They would pick me up in my office, which means they're going to drive. I watch how they drive. I watch how they treat the other people on the road. Okay. Are they yelling and screaming? Are they cutting people off and, you know, flipping them off and, you know, running through red lights? I watch for this because first of all, I'm in the car. So if they get into an altercation, I guess what? I'm stuck with them. That's number one. Number two, I really care about how they're going to treat other people. They don't even know these people, you know? So then that's one part. I'd watch how they drive. I never said, would say anything to them, but I would watch, I would observe. I would observe behavior more than I would go with whatever people said. Now we go to the restaurant. Now the restaurant was owned by a friend of mine. Okay. And I would call him up ahead of time. I'd say, Bill, I'm bringing a, a candidate over for lunch. He said, okay. So you know what to do, right? He said, yeah. I said, okay. Now, here's what Bill knew to do. He would tell the waiter or the waitress, whatever Bill orders, whatever my guy ordered, you know, Joe, right, to make it wrong or, or, or make sure something's not right about it, okay? 
And so when it got delivered, I would watch how he treated the waiter or the waitress. Very simple. Most of the time they go, hey, listen, you messed up my meal, man. I ordered this. You sent me that. What's the matter with you? If they acted like that, now I know how they're going to manage people. So I would always watch and observe for behavior. You know, you want to be a good human being, you be a good human being. You know, we have these, we have these things we, we, we look for. You know, th these things I, I observe. Um, my son, when he was little, um, my mom, my, my grandmother, my grandma was in a, a home, a nursing place. And my mom would go there every day and visit her because it, it was just only five minutes from her house. And she would take my son if she was watching my son. And my son would walk in and there were people in their wheelchairs sitting around in the lobby or whatever, you know. He would walk up and say hello to every one of them. And if they had a blanket on their legs and their toes were sticking out, he would cover their toes. And they got to know him really, really well. You know, they said, oh, here comes John Sebastian. Oh, my gosh, he's such a wonderful young man. Blah, 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 blah. And he turned out to be that way, by the way. Okay? So he's a good person. I know lots of good people. Do you do things for somebody else because somebody else is watching? Or do you do it because it's just the right thing to do and nobody's watching? Absolutely. You know, I, I see people, I see elderly people. I go to this, I call it the stupid market today because <laughs> there's craziness going on there. They have arrows going down the aisles. You have to go one way and not the other way. You have to, you know, and I keep trying to tell the, the store. I say, listen, you have elderly people coming here. That means you have to walk twice the distance. And most of them have bad knees and something. They got to walk twice the distance when they could just go down and get what they have to get. You know, you ought to, you ought to have different hours for let all the old people in and people who are, you know, have, have difficulties and stuff so they can walk however they want. Because if you go down the wrong way, somebody else might say, hey, you're going the wrong way, you know? Um, but here, but here, but here's, here's, here's one. So I watch for people to do these things. Um, so I'm in a store and I'm going down the wrong way because I don't, I don't really care, <laughs> you know? I'm going down the wrong way and the woman was coming down the right way Right. But she was walking backwards, you know, and I thought, oh, she must have maybe she missed something. She was looking for something, but she couldn't find it. So she said, I said to her when she, she looked at me, I said, oh, I'm really sorry. I just noticed I'm going the wrong way down the aisle. And no, I didn't want her to get, you know, start arguing with me or anything. And she said to me, she goes, me too. She goes, I'm going the wrong way, too. I said, but you're facing the right way. She goes, that's right. I just go backwards and people think I missed something. and I'm just going back to find it again. She goes, just turn your cart around and walk backwards. It'll be fine. But I, but I come out of the, the market and, and I see the elderly people, a lot of elderly people. First of all, some of them, they forget where they park their car. And if I see them doing that and I, I keep a distance because I don't want them to think I want to steal from them. I say, I say to them, um, are you okay? You want me to help you find your car? And they say, oh, thank you so much, please. And I go, what does it look like? And I said, you have your keys. You just have an alarm on it. I can hit the button. And it'll go beep, 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 beep. And typically they say, I don't know. I said, let me see your keys and I'll help them find their car. Sometimes it takes me a long time because they go, like, that might be it over there. I go over there, go, oh, that's not it. And I go, oh gosh, what color is it? Oh, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's kind of like blue. And I go, oh God, here we go. I might spend a half an hour. I'm going to help them find their damn car. You know, that's all there is to it. I might see someone, I've seen moms and, 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 and they got little kids with them, little, little, little ones. And they got big, big cases of water. And they're reaching down the bottom of the cart to get these cases of water. They said, excuse me, let me get that for you. You know, I'm doing it because I don't want to see her have to stretch, reach, you know, lift up a heavy case of water, pull a muscle in her back. Then she's got to take these children home yet and bring all the groceries in the house. That's crazy. You know, there's nothing wrong with me saying, can I help you put those in your car? And most of the time they say, oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I mean, I only do that because I don't want to see them struggling. You know, and there's nothing wrong with saying, can I help you with that? And giving them a hand. There's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with it. Absolutely. So, Absolutely, John. Uh, yeah, John uh, be a good human being. Uh, you know what it takes. Yeah. Uh, John, there was a link question to the sales uh, process. But, and then sure. there's another uh, question from Ashraf uh, Jaliawala about the business. So I think I'll throw the quicker one, uh, shorter one first, which right. is that if we had given only five minutes then how do we, what technique we use to build our repo? And you say, okay, you have only five minutes. You don't have time to build a repo and talk long, like you said. So what do we do? What technique should we use? Well, my first question is, I mean, because some of these are setup questions, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not really real, real, real questions. I don't know. How do you know you only have five minutes? Let me start with that. Yes, um, 
So, because to me, to me, the only people I know that have like, if they have five minutes or five seconds or 10 minutes or whatever it is, are the people who go in and visit with doctors, you know, and, and good luck getting an appointment with a doctor because, and all you want them to do, if you're in that, in that business, which is a pharmaceutical business, is you want to have the doctor write prescriptions for your drugs that you're selling. Because, and that's really all, that's really all it amounts to because they, then you get credit because they keep track in the area, you know, um, so very simple techniques. I mean, if you really got to do it, I'm going to tell you one, first of all, if you only have five minutes, I'm going to, I'm going to wish you luck um, because you've got to get in a good, you got to get in a very fast level of rapport with these people of, you can walk with them. You can talk like them. You know, you got to match their voice, their voice tone, their voice quality, the rate of speech, all these things. But sometimes that takes more than five minutes to get really, to, to really do it successfully. The really thing to do, if I only had five minutes with them, is I'd say to them, listen, I only have five minutes with you, but I have something that really would excite you. I got to tell you, or better yet, my question is, how do you, what's the one thing that you could get somebody's attention so that they want to give you more than five minutes? Okay, that's the technique. So here's my question. And you can develop, if you're in sales and you're, do, you're selling things and you only have five minutes, you can work on this and you can get it back to Muhammad, okay? It's this. And and, and I'll tell you one uh, story on this one, John. I was the, one of the biggest uh, telecom companies here. The CEO of the company, he was not able, I was not able to get hold of him. So they told me, you have only five minutes to go and meet him. And once I went in, all I said, I mean, of course I did, uh, I had prepared about the guy already. And we ended up having the meeting for one and a half hours. Sure. So it, I think also depends on how you open up your meeting. Uh, how did you open it? Yeah. I opened it basically by telling him because I knew exactly what issue they were facing in their training. So I said, I am, since I have only five minutes, so I'm only tell you, going to tell you one thing that is going to increase your business by X amount. Would you be interested? And that one thing is not going to end up in five minutes. You'll need to give me 15 minutes. Would you be interested? So that's how I started. So what I, that's right. So what I tell people to do, if you've got to get more than five minutes, I don't know. You have to, you have to have, you start with a question. I got a phone call one time from a guy. And, and I only stayed on the phone with him because I liked his opener, okay? I pick up the phone. I said, hello, John, and this is my private line. I don't even know how he got the number, but he knew my name somehow. So he must have gotten it from somebody who knows because I got a private private consulting line. And uh, I, I answered the phone. I said, hello. He goes, hi, is this John Laval? I said, yeah, what's up? Well, who are you? He says, my name is so-and-so, okay? And then he said, uh, whatever it was, he said something like, I can make you a lot of money. And I said, keep talking. Because I wanted to find out what he had to back that up. Okay. Now, ultimately, he didn't have much to back it up. He sold financial investments and you know all these things. And uh, but I got to tell you, I gave the guy, um, I gave him an A for perseverance and an A for tenacity. Because this guy, he wouldn't quit. He started with, okay, so what, I'd like to come to visit. I'd like to come to your home. I go, I don't do business from my home at all. I don't do business out of my house. I don't have people come to my house to do business. He said, well, well okay, so we can meet at a diner. And I said, listen, he said, I really don't have the money right now, you know? And he said, well, now I wanted to turn him off, but I wanted to still find out how far he was going to go. You know, I like to test things out. And <clears throat> so he said, well, he said, um, he said, well, do you, uh, well, we could put, we could put the investments on a credit card. And I said, oh, oh yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I get my credit cards back. I think, I think, I think I get them back in about six months. That's a clue, right? That's a clue that I lost my credit cards, that the bank took them away. So he should have said, oh, I'm sorry. You know, you must be gotten in trouble, but he didn't. And he said, but he said to me, he said, well, I said, oh, I said, I said, uh, uh, I get my credit cards back in six months. So let me ask you, I said, do you take markers? Now a marker is a gambling term. Okay. Um, and he said, no, 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 no. We're not allowed to do that. The, a marker means, you know, you give me the, you give me the investment now, I'll pay you later, you know, that kind of thing, but you can't do that. And, and, and I could have said, uh, do you take IOUs or anything? But the fact is, when you say the word marker, you're basically telling him you're a gambler too. And if he's smart, he's going to calculate, oh, now I know why you lost your credit cards. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 we don't take markers. He said, but let me ask you something. Do you, um, you have any money coming in? Like, you know, have anything coming in? You got jobs coming up and stuff like that? And I said, no, I, I'm not, I don't have any jobs coming up. I, I, I lost my job. But you know what? My grandma, um, I bless my grandma. They said, she'd been gone for years. I said, my grandma, she's not doing really well. And she told me that she's going to leave me all her money. And she's not really doing well. 
the doctor said he gives her maybe like another month or so before she's gone. And he said, oh, okay, thank you very much. And he hung up. That guy called me back a month later and said to me, is your grandmother dead yet? And I said, I said, no, as a matter of fact, she's had a miraculous recovery. And the doctor says she's probably got another five or six years now. And he said, all right, well, thank you very much when he hung up. Well, the only thing, the only thing that, that got me going was this was opening line. So here's my question for you in sales. If you want to get more than five minutes, you've got to do one of two things, okay? And, and, and Muhammad did these. He said, listen, I only got five minutes, okay? But I would switch the sequence around a little bit. I'd say you have to have an answer to the question that they have in their mind. I'm gonna tell you what that question is. What can you do for me? You call me on a telephone, you go, hi, hey, this is Charlie Brown. I go, in my mind, I go, yeah, so what do you want already? Get to the bottom, man, I'm busy, right? What, what, so why do you bother me on my phone? What do you want from me? Or what can you do for me? I mean, that's what I wanna know. Most people don't do that. They wanna explain all these other things to me first. I'm not interested, I hang up. I go, thank you so much, but I hang up. So number one, the opener should be, what can you do for me? You should have an answer to that question. Okay. That's number one. Then when they say, really, you go, yeah, well, listen, I only got five minutes with you. Okay. Now I'm promise you something. If you give me the five minutes, give me just five minutes. If you want to continue on, I'm going to ask you, should we keep going? If you're not interested anymore and you say, no, nah, we're done. I'm not interested. Hang up the phone, go to the next call kids. Okay. Because there's no sense in wasting their time. Right. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. It's sometimes I tell people the, the reason, the reason number one, to make a phone call, and I, and I know it depends on the product and the service, the really only reason, unless it's, it's a, a small item thing, is to make a phone call is to get a face-to-face -face appointment because they can easily hang up on a telephone. But if you're in their office, they're probably not, they're going to have a more difficult time throwing you out of their office, although it has been done. So, but once you're in their office, so what I tell people to do is to go, listen, you call them up and you go, listen, I can, I can help you with this. I can do this for you. And they go, really? Well, yeah, listen, but listen, I don't want to waste your time on the phone right now. If this is possible for you to do this, I'm going to be in your neighborhood next week. So I can, I can stop in. I'm going to be right, right around your area by, on Tuesday. Just give, if you just, just give me 30 minutes. If you're not, if you don't, if after 30 minutes, I'm going to stop after 30 minutes and you better stop too. You better keep track. I'm going to stop after 30 minutes and I'm going to ask you, do you want me to continue or do you want me to, or you're not interested? We should stop. And so just give me the 30 minutes of your time. And I, I, and I promise you I'll do that. Most times people say, sure, come on. Okay. Cause you're only taking 30 minutes out of their time. Now, the next thing is you get to go visit them. First thing you do is you ask them, you actually, you thank them for the time. So I want to thank you for the 30 minutes. I really appreciate it. Now you, now you do your thing for the 30 minutes and it better not be showing your PowerPoint stuff. You better talk to them and ask them about stuff. Hey, tell me how your business is. I want to know a little bit more about your business before I can explain to you what I can do for you. Blah, blah, blah. Yak, yak, yak. Tell me about you. Oh, your great, great grandfather. Yeah, wow. Holy. Do all of that. Make sure you clock that time in 30 minutes and you stop in 30 minutes. Okay. And hopefully by 15 minutes and you're already, you know, presenting your product or your service. You better stop at that 30 minute point because they're looking for your honesty and they're looking for if you're paying attention for them. Not on them, but for them. Absolutely. Okay. I told you I'd stop in 30 minutes. I'm going to stop. Do you want to continue on or should we just call it quits? And I'll just leave and you'll never see me again. Almost all the time, if you got them interested enough, they're going to say, keep talking. I got time. Okay. Because time, the time excuse and the money excuse, they're bull. They're bull. I know. I think I'm going to agree with that one. Uh, which takes me on to my next question uh, from Ashraf. Yeah. How business leaders use or can use, I think, he wants to say, NLP techniques while handling teams with different backgrounds? Well, I don't know. I guess you got to know the cultures a little bit. But you know what? As far as I know, uh, with a few exceptions, um, you can treat people the same, you know, uh, certain things. I was on it. You got to know the people, of course. I think it's more generational than people with different backgrounds. And, of course, different professional areas are different, you know, computer programs are different than the salespeople and the marketing people are different than the manufacturing people and all this stuff. Um, I find that I, I just did this last night. I was on a, I was on another uh, webinar uh, last night and uh, it was the same kind of question. Motivation is a very interesting thing because 
and, and you, you might find this uh, very different than what you've been taught, okay? As a leader, as a manager, are you ready? You are not responsible for motivating the people, period, okay? You can't motivate the other people, not really. You, can, you are responsible for certain things to do. You're responsible, ready? You are responsible, you're the leader, you're a manager, whatever. You're responsible for setting the environment that enables them to become successful. You got to give them the tools. If they need a computer, you got to get them a computer. You know, you can't argue with them. Well, what do you need a computer for? If they really need a computer, get them a computer. If they need pencils, get them pencils. You know, don't say, oh, go buy your own at the store. People want to know that you care about them. I managed up to 75 people at the same time once working in a company. Okay. And I'm going to make another statement. I managed in one company, I managed 40 women. Think about that. 40 women and one guy. The one guy stayed in his office all day because he didn't want to deal with the 40 women. Now, there was nothing wrong with the 40 women. They were all great workers. But the problem was, if one had a problem, then they all had the problem. Okay? So I had to manage that. Now, that was easy enough to do for me, okay? Because I made sure I treated them all the same. I treated them all equally. I paid attention to them. I walked around. I did. I asked them, how's your family doing? All these things, okay? So... These things, are, these things are important. These things are more valuable. And these aren't NLP techniques. You might want to use some of the NLP skills to learn how to open up a little bit of a conversation. I worked for probably five really good executives um, in my time with, with companies. And, and uh, what I liked about them was they, 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 they liked me and, and they mentored me and they were very hard on me too. They were very, they were very, they were tough. But they were, they were good about it. You know, they'd say, come in my office. What the hell did you do now? They go, I don't know. They go, you know, you messed this one thing up or what happened? I go, oh, well, I really didn't miss the whole thing up. They go, go to the board. Let's, let's draw this out so this doesn't happen again. Tell me what the strategy is. Tell me what you're going to do next time. Blah, blah, blah. And I appreciated that. But two guys stand out in my mind. Some of you have been to my seminars. You heard me tell the story. I'm not going to tell the story. I got fired by the same guy six times. Okay? For making decisions. Okay? He didn't like me. That was plain and simple. I didn't, he didn't hire me into the job. I was put in the job by the president and the vice president because this guy was misbehaving himself and he needed to put me between the employees before they went on strike, blah, blah, blah. And <coughs> sorry, I didn't like him. He didn't like me, plain and simple. And uh, that was one guy. He would go around and it wasn't me. It wasn't just me. Nobody liked the guy. And it was only a matter of time before he finally lost his job. But he would walk around asking people the following question. At the end of the day, what did you do for me today? What did you do for me today? Like, and I'm like, like, who cares? You know, As a matter of fact, and I might use a little bit of not very vulgar language, but some little bit. We're in the meetings and he would say, because he came from another country, okay, a, Europe, a Eastern European country. And he'd go to come to these meetings and he'd go, look at me. He said, when I came here, all I had was $600 in my pocket and look where I am today. Okay. And I got so tired of that. One time I raised my hand and I go, listen, when I came to this country, I had no clothes on my ass and look where I am today. Okay. And that finally got him to stop, stop his whining and complaining and picking on everybody. But nobody liked this guy. Now on the other side was the president of the company, the president of the company. He was all of 37 or 38 years old. Everybody loved the guy, not because he was 37 or 38. He'd walk around the office. Now, maybe there were maybe 200 people in the whole office of this place, but there were, there were different places all over the country, but this was the main headquarters. He'd walk in and he'd say, he'd walk in, he'd knock on the door and he'd say, hey, Muhammad, how you doing? And you go, I'm doing good. I'm doing good, boss. What's up? Well, so let me, let me come sit down. He sit down. He go, how's your family doing? How's everything? Is, is, is little, you know, is little Muhammad going still playing football, soccer, things like that? How's your daughter? She's still doing the martial arts. You know, how's your wife doing? He would sit down and have a little conversation with you, but he knew your name. He knew who you were, okay? If he saw you because he was leaving the parking lot, he'd call you over and say, hey, come over here. What a second, why are you running home so fast? What's up? How are you doing? How's the job going? You know, he would ask questions about you, not about him. And, uh, and people love working for this guy. Now, I've seen all different kinds of managers in that whole range. So NLP techniques, and you got to know a lot about motivation. You are not, you, you cannot motivate people. The only people who can motivate the person is themselves. 
They're either going to want to or not want to come to work, period. I go to my bank years ago. I, I still go to my bank. But years ago, I would go to my bank because I know these ladies that are in there for 30 years. And I would ask them the following question because I would predict the economy. I wanted to predict the stock market, not each stock, but I wanted to predict the, the, the general market. And I wanted to predict the economy. Ask them a very simple question because I did study economics. All these other things these guys come up with, all these, all these crazy uh, theories of theirs, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I'd walk in and I'd ask them the question every now and then. i go, what are people doing these days? Are they putting or taking? Are they putting money in the bank or taking money out of the bank? Now, if they were putting money in the bank, that means the, the economy was going to go down a little bit because people aren't buying things. We have to buy things in our economy, not put money in the bank. But if they were taking money out of the bank, I knew the economy was going to get a little bit better. Very simple. Okay, so, so they were used to me coming in and saying, what are people doing today? Putting or taking? But then one day, I asked, I asked the, about three of them there, one at a time, individually. Um, I said to them, can I ask you a question? And they said, sure. I said, I'm doing some research. I was doing some research, actually. I said, let me ask you a question. What would I have to do so that you would look forward to coming to work on Monday, Monday morning? Every one of them said basically the same thing. They said, you just did it. I said, what did I do? They said, you just asked me for my opinion. And I said, really? And they said, yeah. I said, does it matter if I care about your opinion or not? They said, well, you wouldn't have asked, John. You wouldn't have asked if you didn't care about our opinion. I don't know if you can do anything about our opinion if we gave it to you, you know, because you're not our boss here. But the fact that you asked me what, why, what, what would want to make me come back every Monday and look forward to coming in on Monday morning, which nobody looks forward to coming in on Monday morning, um, is you asked me what I thought. And that was a great big lesson for me. Now, this was back in the 90s. I was doing some research on some things with companies and stuff, you know, and basically around motivation. And, that, and, it, and it hit me. It hit me like, wow, oh my gosh. I asked them what they thought. I asked them for their opinion, but not just because, and I didn't argue with them, or I wasn't in a position to argue with them. So there's a whole thing now. If you're going to ask somebody something, are you asking them because you really want to understand or because you never want to argue and disagree with them? I post that to the leaders. I post that to the managers. If you're not really interested, don't ask. Okay. Because people are going to tell you their opinion. And if you want to argue with their opinion, instead of thinking about their opinion, you know, maybe it makes sense. And somebody asked me, they asked me um, last night was, it was another question about this Corona thing going on that people are at home working. And so how do you motivate the people at home working? Research has already shown you don't have to motivate them. They're home working. They're happy. They're happy they're home. They don't have to go drive to work and they're doing their job. Matter of fact, some of them are even working more hours than they normally would to get the job done. There's no interference. There's not people coming in their cubicle, interrupting them, phones ringing all day long, all these other things, the boss bothering them. If you're a good manager, right? If you're a good boss, you're a good manager, you're a good leader. It's very simple. I can tell how good a leader is by how well their team does when the leader's not there. Absolutely. Very Absolutely. simple. Absolutely. Very simple. Absolutely, John. Sounds kind of a little crazy to some people. My job, when I when I was working, I, I told you, I've worked, I had 75 people working for me. I've had 15 people. I've had 30 people. I've had all kinds of people working for me that reported to me. My job was to make sure they were all well-trained enough that they don't need me. I don't have to follow them around. I don't have to look for mistakes. I'm somebody's going to make a mistake. I got to pay attention to what's going on. But I, my job was to work my way out of that job so that they didn't need me in that job. Absolutely. Great, uh, great advice, John. And we'll you know, be. People, um, people are asking, people are asking for NLP techniques. They, they keep forgetting what I said in the beginning the skills are more important than the techniques. Yeah. Yes, this is more common sense, and, and these are the basic ethics uh, of humanity, I believe. Uh, uh, John, uh, moving to the next uh, question, uh, it is about the HR people. Uh, there, is a, there are three, four different HR people who are listening to us and who have joined us. And they say that uh, in HR, uh, again, this question has come back. I know we had this earlier as well. They're saying that in HR, uh, when we are evaluating people, like you said about the interview things. So they said, then what are, should we all get trained for NLP or it is just the uh, yeah, certain techniques that we should be training our teams with, or they all need to be NLP practitioners. That's basically the question. Well, I think everybody should be trained, but 
you know, to, to go to go to go, they should be trained in NLP. You know, um, they should be they should be taught how to communicate better. You know, they should they, they should be taught that it's okay to, to to speak their mind or give their opinion. But this has to go from the top down. You know, you can't you you know if you just train the people in the in the middle of the organization or the lower bottom bottom part of the organization, that's not going to be good enough at all. Um, it's much more difficult to train the people higher up because they think they know everything. You know, executives don't need training. You know. Well, most of them need training. I have to tell you, my, my, my strategy, you know, I did a lot of corporate work. My strategy is this. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to use your name again. I don't care. It's going to use your name. So you're, the, so you're the vice president of the company, big company, right? And you come to me, you go, listen, yeah, you, I need, I need you to work with all my guys. There's something's not right. Their, their, their communication is uh, not good. And I say, okay, no, no problem. First thing I think I already know is that they're not the problem first. He's the problem first. Because if he can't get his people to communicate, he's not doing good training with them. To me, a good manager trains their people, make sure they have good training. They really should. Managers should not be a manager. They should be coaches. You know, they should be coaching their people, mentoring their people, nurturing their people, you know? To me, that, that that's what that's what runs good companies, you know? Um, I don't even know how many managers you need in a company to tell you the truth. So, I mean, I got a whole thing about that, you know, about, uh, you know, I, I did the project one time where the, they were two departments arguing. There was a, the engineers who fixed the machines and then there's the people who run the machines, but their managers and supervisors were fighting all the time. It's your people messing this up. Ah, it's your people. They don't know how to fix machines. And the plant manager guy come to me one day and he said to me, do you think you can help me straighten these guys out? And I said, sure, no problem. He said, well, what do you want to do? I said, oh, what we're going to do is I'm going to take all the supervisors and all the managers out of the building for a week. I'm going to take them to a hotel. I'm going to do some team building. I'm going to do some training on communication skills. We'll see if we can't fix it up. And he said to me, oh, who's going to run the place? If, there, if there's no supervisors and managers here, I said, the union, the hourly people are going to run the place. He said to me, you're crazy. I said, I know, but that's got nothing to do with this. He said, Who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna manage them? I said they're gonna manage themselves. I said, listen, they already know the job. Some of them have been here 25, 30 years. You think they don't know their job? Do they mess up sometimes? Yeah, they mess up sometimes. So what? Okay. So I'm gonna take those the union people. I'm gonna go talk to the union, the bosses of the union, you know, the heads of the union. I'm gonna tell them what we're gonna do. And I did. I got with the union guys and I said, listen, guys, I have an idea. Uh, I know there's a lot of problems going on between the managers and supervisors. I like to take them out of the plant, take them out of here into a hotel for a week. You know what they said? Oh, thank God. Oh, thank, thank everybody. Thank, thank, thank all the gods. They don't care. They said, oh my gosh, this is great. Get them out of here. I said, why? They go, they mess things up. They come in, they want to change this. They don't have to change it. They want to make a change. They don't have to make a change. They, they, they're on us all the time bothering us. We know our jobs. I said, I know you know your jobs. That's why I'm talking to you. So let me ask you a question. Do you guys think you can run this place for a week? without any bosses? He said, of course we can. He said, great. You're willing to do that? He said, of course. I said, you're going to go talk to all the people about this? They said, sure. I said, perfect. If you need me to help you, I'll be there when you explain it to the people. I'll be do, I'll do that for you. And they said, ah, we'll be okay, John. We really appreciate it. See, I got along with all the union people. I got along with them because I knew they were the people who were making things work and they were people making the decisions. So then I told the union guys, I said, listen, one more thing. Tell the people that because I'm going to tell the managers and the bosses, they better not make any telephone calls to find out how you're doing. I don't, if any of them call you, I want you to let me know. I'm going to give you my home number. I want you to call me and tell me, hey, Bill called me. You want to know how things were going. I'm not going to go to Bill and say anything. I just want to know who's going to not follow my very simple instructions with them because I'm telling them you're not allowed to make any phone calls. Leave everybody alone. And they said, cool. I think in that week I might have got five or six they called me, hey, listen, Charlie called me. He wanted to know how things were going. I said, thanks so much. Don't worry, I'm not going to say anything. Now I know I can't trust Charlie to follow instructions. Very simple. They ran this place for a week. Even the plant manager, I said, he said, what am I supposed to do? I said, sit in your office. Don't come out. Just sit in there. Stay home. Go on a vacation. I don't care. Just get, get lost. I don't care. Leave these people alone. He said, okay. And they did for a week. They did great. Ready? They broke all production records. They broke all quality records. They broke all, all the money records, of course, okay? No, ready for this? No absenteeism. In other words, everybody showed up every day on time. Nobody called in sick. 
You believe this? You ready for this piece? This is the most magic one of all. Machines didn't break down. I guess they were in on the whole plan too. Now I did consider, oh, maybe they broke down a little bit, but they didn't write it down. You know, I thought about that. But I asked the mechanics, I said, you sure nothing broke down? They said, John, nothing broke down. We made sure we maintained everything. You know, we made sure everything was running right. If we had to make adjustments, we made adjustments. We didn't wait for anything to break down. Nothing broke down. I said, this is perfect. Now, at the end of this program I had with the, with the, with the uh, managers and supervisors, the president of the company comes in at the end of the thing. He said, I want to thank you guys. How was John? You have a good time with John. He teaches some things, blah, 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 all this nice stuff. And he said, I understand everything ran really well while you guys weren't there. Production records, broke all production records, broke all quality records, broke all, you know, machine, and the machines didn't break down. No absenteeism. Nobody called in sick. That's fantastic. And they went, yeah. They went, give yourselves a round of applause and get everybody applause. He said, I had a question now. And they all went, oh, okay. He said, what do I need you guys for? And then he walked out. That was on a Friday afternoon. That whole weekend, these guys were worried. They were sweating. I'm going to lose my job. I think three of them actually quit because they thought they were going to get fired. They weren't going to get fired. That was a good question he asked them. By the way, that was that 38-year-old guy. He said, what do I need you for? They ran a whole week without you. What do I need you guys for? Um, I'm kind of interested. And uh, then wait for the answer. It was a rhetorical question in his mind. But that was a great lesson. You've got to let people do their job. You know, if you, if you appreciate them, you know, I had a guy one time, uh, it was his birthday. I'm in a manufacturing plant. It's his birthday. So I called him to the office over the PA system. Okay. I'll never forget his name. His name was Vinny. Vinny. Uh, Vinny, please come to the office. And he comes to my office and he's steaming mad. And as he opened my door, now I know why he's steaming mad because he got called to my office. All the other employees are going, ooh, ooh, what'd you do now, Vinny? And I said, oh, man. And Vinny comes in my office, pounds his hand on my desk. He goes, why did you get the call? Why couldn't you? I said, Vinny, slow down, slow down, slow down a second. I called you in here to wish you happy birthday. Oh, yeah, but you know, you called me over to PA and come to the office. Now they all wonder what I did wrong. I said, don't worry about it. You know why? Take an extra half hour on your break today. I'm going to go buy you coffee and I'm going to buy you some desserts. Come on, let's go in a cafeteria. You and I will sit down, we'll chat. And then when he went back, everybody go, what, what did Laval want? What did Laval want? He said, none of your business. It's my birthday. He took good care of me. But these are how the people acted. So to, if I had known that, I could have I could have gone to him and said, hey, Vinny, and today's your birthday. I wanted to say happy birthday. I could have said that on his job and not called him. I didn't know, but now I know. So how you treat the people, you got to let them do their jobs too. You got to let them do their job. Your part of job as a manager is to make sure your people are well trained and they know their job. Absolutely. And then Absolutely. let them do it. Then let them do it. Absolutely. Um, John, which takes me to the next uh, last three questions, I guess, uh, because I know your time is also. Uh, yeah, I got to stop at around nine. I got another yeah. appointment. Yeah. Uh, uh, nine, my time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, it's more than a question, it's a comment that what and how can we inculcate NLP techniques in syllabi in schools, colleges, and universities? And which one would you recommend for the, uh, from, the, from the beginning for the children to, to be taught to them? Hey, you're going back to those techniques again. That's the question. It's not in the techniques. It's in the skills. Yes. Um, you know, they should teach the children, number one, to pay attention to the other children, learn, how to learn a little bit from them. You know, it's okay to teach the skills, you know, teach them. Is that person using more visual words or more auditory words? Are they, you know, look at their eyes and wonder what they're doing. Are they, are they making a, are they remembering something? Are they creating something? Oh, did when their eyes went down this way, what was, what do you think was going on? Can you check it out? We didn't have these problems when I was a kid in school, you know, oh, we picked on other kids sometimes, you know, I got picked on myself, you know, and the other guys would rough you up and this stuff, you know, all these other things that went on in school, but you know what, we all got along. So it's about what can we teach? It's not about the, again, I'm going to say the techniques because people keep saying what techniques are good to teach in the schools. If you want to read a book, a really great book, okay, it was out by Richard Bandler and Kate Benson, all right? Yeah. It's called Teaching Maybe. Excellence. There's loads of stuff in there. And it doesn't have to be just for schools. It could be for parents at home. You know, it's very, very simple. Uh, it's a great book. It's, a loaded, it's all NLP stuff. It's got all kinds of things in there, all kinds of ideas. Um, that's why people say what are the techniques, you know. People, kids, children get anchored 
to their to their school to their desk at work. I mean, in school. I mean, if if they're sitting at a desk and have to sit in the same desk all the time, that's not necessarily a good thing. You know, um, I accessing cues. Teach the teachers about I accessing cues, because I remember I, I figured out a long time back when I was first learning NLP that one of the things that happened in school. I did okay in school. I did great in college, but I did okay in, in grammar school. I did that pretty pretty good in high school. But I could have done better in grammar school, except I tended to sit towards the back of the class. And the reason I sat back in the class was because the teacher seemed to ask a lot of questions to the children in the front of the class. And what I noticed about that over the years was that the children who sat in the front of the class tended to do better. Now, I didn't know why they would do better. Um, I, I just, I mean, I didn't know why then, except we thought, oh, they're the teacher's favorites. You know, that's what we thought, oh, the teacher's favorites. But what I realized then later on was that when the teacher would, would if you were taking a test, the teacher would walk up and down in the rows in the class, and perhaps that um, she would say to somebody, stop looking at that other person's paper. But that wasn't with the people in the front of the room, because she was already in the middle of the room. So those children got to be picked on more. The other thing was that if they asked the question, and the child looked up like this, the teacher would say, the answer's not on the ceiling. Yes. It's in your book, you know, these kind of things. Well, guess what? The answer is not on the ceiling, but you got to move your eyes. It's the eye accessing things. You got to move your eyes in order to access that data inside your brain. You know what I tell the children now? Study your lessons. Make sure you know them. Go over them with your parents if you want. You know, go let them test you out a little bit. And when a teacher asks you a question, even if you're taking a test, close your eyes and think about the answer. You can move your eyes any way you want. Just close your eyelids to do it so the teacher doesn't think you're looking around. That was a very simple thing to do. So that's what I tell the kids now, you know? And by the way, we can teach spelling strategy. We can teach a kid a spelling strategy uh, probably in about 10 minutes and they can learn that strategy. They can use it to spell any word. I don't care how big it is. I don't even care if they know what the word means. I don't care how many letters it has, okay? Teach them a strategy, you know, because the phonetics thing doesn't work. Phonics doesn't really work. There's a lot of words that phonics doesn't work for. You can't even use phonics to spell phonics. You know, phonics is F-O-N-I-X, but that's not how we spell it. We spell it P-H-O-N-I-C-S. So how do we pronounce it? Pahonics? I mean, what is this? You can't even use the word to spell the word. Some, some languages are very phonetic. You know, German is phonetic, very phonetic. Not everything about it, but it's, it's quite easy to do that. So the idea to me is that, is that uh, there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, get the book reading, you know, Teaching Excellence. It's, there's loads and loads of stuff in there. It's a fantastic book. It was written by Richard Bandler and Kate Benson. Um, there's a lot we can do in the educational system. Here in the U.S., there's a lot we can do in the educational system, but it's very, very slow getting it into the educational systems. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, but here in the U.S. anyway, uh, all the schools, all the educational systems in the different states, they're all run differently because they're different states. You know, the U.S. is like a bunch of different countries. And also because the educational, the teachers and everyone are... Um, they all or, or they belong to a, t a teacher's union. So as soon as you say, oh, we want to teach the teachers this, and they go, oh, good, let's see, oh, okay, who's going to do this? Uh, how are we going to reward them? And all these other things. And then, of course, there's, no, there's not enough money there for this stuff. So it's much more difficult here getting it into this educational systems. Kate Benson actually did something and proved how this can work in one of the counties in the UK and followed these children through a few grades, Durham County. Uh, we know it works. You know, we, we know it works. We've had one school system brought us in one time, or Kathleen and I, and we spent time with these teachers and we taught them these things. But you know what? The teachers, some of them were like, they go, wow, this is great. Some of the teachers went, oh, this is garbage. This is, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Until we brought one kid in who was lousy at spelling and taught him how to spell, then they had, they had nothing else to say. But one more thing we did with these teachers, just so you know, because you know, I told you I like to test things. I think we should always have to test things, was... I said to them one morning, I said, okay, put all your books away, please. Take out a pencil and paper. We're going to have a pop quiz. They went crazy. They went, what do you mean pop quiz? You didn't tell us there was going to be a pop quiz. You didn't give us time to study. You didn't tell us what to study for or anything like that. How can you give us a pop quiz? That's not fair. And I said, well, because this is what you do to the children. <laughs> and they're like, well, yeah, but, you know, that's different. I go, how? How's it different? Explain it to me. Yeah. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, John, thank you very much for this one also. And the last two uh, questions, which I'll go, go for uh, one is uh, 
uh, which has one is my question and <laughs> the other one is uh, you know a question which is actually it's not mine my students have asked me this one ah, why sure. can't why, why why can't we why can't we do an nlp trainers training here in in pakistan i said i i'll ask uh, John, I don't know the answer to that yet. <laughs> so. uh, listen, that's a fair question. It really is a fair question. The fact is, we have people come from all over the world to go to a trainer yeah. training, and we only do them in Orlando. You know, there's a whole lot of things that have to happen before we did it in another foreign country, really. You know, we did it in London maybe about six or seven or eight years ago. Um, but the fact is, we, 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 we prefer at the moment anyway to do it in Orlando, whether we can do it over in who knows which country, because again, the problem, one of the problems is that we would get, first of all, if we did it in Pakistan, there's probably not enough people, master trainer, uh, master practitioners and these things that would want to go. You know, and not enough people, really. Um, I don't know how easy it is for other people from other countries to get to, to Pakistan. You know, I just, I mean, I just don't know. But the fact is, we, we prefer to do it in Orlando because we have all kinds of things we can do it. We've been there for 21 years at the hotel. We know the hotel. We have all the equipment we need because we've got lots of equipment we use. It's not just a trainer training. We're not going to teach you NLP. We're going to teach you presentation skills. We're going to teach you how to get your point across. We're going to teach you how to get the information into your, your audience's head, things like this. And all of that stuff is already housed in Orlando. I live in New Jersey. Right now, I drive down to Orlando you know, to do the seminars. But sooner or later, though, I'm going to move to Orlando. So I'm going to even, even be living there, living, living in Florida. Yeah. Um, we get questions from all other countries, too. Just You're not the only ones. Can you come to India? You know, can you come to Germany? Can you come to, you know, but not for the train. The trainer training is a very different thing. We go to different countries sometimes for different seminars uh, with Richard. And it really depends on how far the travel is, believe it or not. Uh, Richard can't travel that very, very far on airplanes. Um, that's one problem. He's got to be very careful. You know, he had a minor, he had a minor stroke years ago. And he's got to be careful of, um, uh, of blood clots when, when you're flying in your, with your legs and things. So he's, he also has to be careful with that. Well, that's why you don't see us traveling around so far as much. But uh, hey, who knows? Maybe one of these days. Who knows? Yeah, great. And uh, the last question, uh, John, I will take is uh, basically, which is a question from a lot of students and uh, people who are especially now working at home. That is about procrastination and laziness. And how can they, because they say that this is killing their lives. So how can they uh, control their mind? What would you advise them with, by which they can actually overcome procrastination and laziness? Well, procrastination is a, that's a bull, that's a bullshit excuse because um, procrastination is a conscious activity. Let me start with that. In other words, it's not like you forget to do something. You know, if you forget to do something, I go to the store, I got a shopping list. If I forget to get the milk, I go, oh, I forgot to get the milk. I didn't procrastinate getting the milk. I just plain old forgot to get the milk. Okay. If I forgot to write a check and pay a bill, I forgot to write the check. If I sit down, I go, oh, I got to write that check today. Now nah, I'll do it tomorrow. That's procrastination. That's conscious activity. That means you have control over your brain. Let me start with that. So um, you can do a lot of things. Like I said it first things was get out of your pajamas, you know, or whatever. We get up in the morning, shave, or if you shave, shave, you know, take a shower, comb your hair, put clothes on, make like you're going someplace. You're programming your brain, believe it or not, all this while this is going on. And this is not even, a, this is not, this might seem like a, I'm being a little bit light about this. When I first went into my own consulting business and I, I worked for, was working from my home and a friend of mine who was a consultant called me up. He said, Hey, how you doing? You started, huh? I said, yeah. He said, uh, let me, can I ask you something? I said, sure. He said, if I have something that I think would help you out to do even better in your business, would you want me to tell you what it is? Cause I don't like to just give my opinion unless you're interested. I said, absolutely. Go ahead. He said, let me ask you this question. How do you know the difference between when you're at work and when you're at home, because you're at your, you're doing things in your house. How do you know when you're when you're at home and when you're at work? And that was a great question. But I said to him, like, well, like, well, what do you mean? You know, uh, explain this to me a little bit. He said, well, he said, when I started out, what happened was I'd get up in the morning, I'd say, oh, it's a nice day out there. Let me go out and cut the grass. It's the morning time. I'll cut cut the, cut the grass. Then I say, ah, oh, now it's about eleven o'clock. I should wash the car and wash the car. He said, then I do a few other things around the house. And you know what? He said, by the afternoon, it was before four o'clock, I, re I realized I wasn't doing much to, to, to market my business. You know, you got selling and you got marketing. This is the time to market your stuff, market your business, get people ready. Let me tell you something, when the economies, when, it, when these economies open up, people are going to want to spend money. They may not even have a lot because they're not getting paid right now, but they're going to want to go out and do things. So I would get ready for marketing. And then he said to me, so I realized that. So you know what I started doing would help me out a lot. I said, sure, what is it? He said, so I get up in the morning. I shower, I shave, 
put on a suit, maybe, maybe even just a shirt and tie and a jacket, I would leave. I went out for breakfast. I'd go to the little diner down the street. I'd have my breakfast. I'd, then I'd come to work. I worked from uh, in the morning till noontime. At noontime, I'd put my jacket on. I'd go out. I'd go to lunch, just like I was doing when I was working. And I would have a little lunch. Then I'd come back to work, one o'clock. And then I'd work till four or five o'clock. At five o'clock, you know what I would do? i put my jacket on. I would leave the house. I'd go back down to the little diner. I'd have a Coca-Cola, maybe a cup of coffee or something. And then I'd come home. Now I do my thing and I'd wait and cut the grass on Saturday. I'd spend those days, Monday to Friday, marketing my business, doing these other things. He said, now I don't know if that's going to help you out or not, but knowing NLP, what I did was, as he was explaining it to me, I tried it out. I tried it out in my brain. And I thought, okay, I don't have to literally leave my house now. I have to have a pattern. I set up a pattern in order for me to be successful in my business. Now, most people don't know this, Okay. If you, if you try to call my office, by the way, at four o'clock in the morning, you're going to get an answering machine because the phones do not ring. Matter of fact, the phones aren't turned on until after eight o'clock in the morning here. I'm up almost every day between four o'clock and 4.30, sometimes five, sometimes 3.30. I am up and already working because I deal with people on the other side of the big pond around the world. And they're already emailing me. It's four o'clock in the morning for me. It's nine o'clock in the morning in England, for example. Right. So they're already contacting me about stuff. And I got used to that in my early days because people would call me up and leave me a message, say, oh, this is so and so. Oh, give me a call back when you're in your office. And I thought, I'm not calling you back. I'm not doing that. No way. I'll just start answering the telephone. Well, now we changed our phone system around, but I still get up every day at four o'clock, 430 in the morning, sometimes 330. Today, I was up at 330 in the morning. I got all my emails out of the way, the ones I could get before it came to being around six o'clock. I was going to be online here at seven. And so I said, uh, about six o'clock, I said, oh, let me grab a little something to eat because um, I got to run out later on and then I won't have time to grab something. And I do that every single day without fail. So you know what? Act like you have things to do. Get up, get dressed, get on, the, get on your computer, email people, start marketing. This is the time to market and, and, and let people know what's available to them. This thing is not going to last forever. We've been through this before, these virus things. We've been through this before. This is not new. It's different in different countries, mostly because of the weather, believe it or not. And, you know, people should really be, I think people should be careful because according to the one thing that most people agree on out there, these experts, I don't even know if they're really experts or not. They don't know how this thing, this thing gets transferred around to people so fast. That's what they don't know. And so to me, be protected. You know, if you got to stay away from people, stay away from people. You're going to go out to the store, wear your mask. You know, you got to wear gloves, wear gloves. You know, I do it anyway. I do it anyway because other people are doing it. And I tell people, they say, I've had people ask me, they say, did you, uh, are you worried about getting this virus? I said, no, I'm not really worried about getting it. I say, I, I, I have a good immune system. And they go, oh, how do you know that? I said, because I was born in New Jersey and I played in the dirt when I was a kid. And then we don't have children doing these things these days. If you, yeah. <laughs> my son, you know, he was always getting sick when he was young. And we didn't rush him to the doctor. You know, we just call the doctor and go, well, he go, what's his fever? What's his temperature? He go, ah, it's only half a, half a point up. He goes, don't worry. Don't worry about it. If that doesn't go away in about three or four more days, then give me a call. Because the fact of the matter was that he would, he would, he knew that while the children were sick, they'd be building up immunity. So he knew all of this. See? So, yeah. Um, yeah, get busy in doing things, man. If you're in business and you've got things to do, you know, be, be sure to be sure to just go out there and start marketing your business. Stay if you got customers, stay in touch with your customers, man. Just get a hold of them, email them, do a Zoom or call with them and say, hey, how you doing? Just checking up on you. Everything OK? Anything else I can do for you right now? Blah, 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 blah. Nothing wrong with that. You know, stay in, stay in touch with them. Absolutely, John. And uh, before I, uh, you know, say thanks to you and, and hang up the call, uh, I would, uh, since I'm going to announce my as I promised, I'm going to announce my NLP practitioner starting from 22nd June. And here we have John because uh, uh, he's now, he is the president of the society. So he can always vouch uh, for the for you guys to attend that course and actually learn a lot of those skills, not the techniques as John has been mentioning uh, with me. And I'm sure John will have a word or two to add to it. Yeah, we teach, you know, we teach the skills and then we also teach like some techniques so you know how to put them together. I mean, that's, that, that's what we really do. Um, so I'm going to tell you this, okay? I'm going to do a shout out right here. Are you ready for this? I'm going to do a quick shout out, all right? 
Muhammad's a stand-up guy. He does what he says he's going to do, all right? He's a, he's a good guy. He knows his stuff. Uh, he's been trained by another good guy. Um, you know, for sure you want to get to see him. I, I don't know what else to say, really. He's, he's, he's a good guy. Um, I don't come out and do, I don't, I don't, I don't go out and do webinars for trainers or people that I don't really have confidence in. I just don't bother. I would not come out and do this if I didn't have any faith in Muhammad. All right. He's a good guy. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. And before uh, this one guy, he's asking me again and again, one question, he says that, how can I increase my awareness? So please, if you can just one line, one minute answer. Oh, sure. And then. Increase your awareness. There's something we call, it's not just awareness alone, but it's situational awareness. Get out of your head, man. You're talking to yourself too much. I can promise you that. Because if you're not paying attention on the outside of your head, that means you're paying attention on the inside. You're talking to yourself too much. Now, you're probably going to say, well, how do I stop talking to myself? Well, it's real simple. Uh, it might seem like it's difficult, but it's really more simple. Play music inside your head. That's what we do. If you play music inside your head, you can't go talking to yourself. And then you open your eyes up, you open your ears up, you open up all your senses, and you pay attention outside. All right? It's, it's very simple. We call it situational awareness. I walk around, um, you know, I, I walk around when I, I grew up in New Jersey, used to go to New York City, and I was taught, keep looking around, notice things, you know. You know, they got this thing now to go, if you see something, say something. I see so many things, I can't say anything. But I'm always watching around what's going on. I could see somebody's eyes flick. You know, I might, might notice somebody's looking at somebody a little bit too long, a little bit too much. I go, something's going to go down here. Something's going wrong. You've got to learn situational awareness, not just awareness, period. All kinds of awareness. I could walk in and my wife laughs at me. I walk in my, and I don't really care about, I don't really care about what she does. But I say to her, oh, honey, how much money did you take from my money clip? And she says, well, how do you know I took money? I go, you took some money. I don't really care, but I just want to know how much so I don't have to go count it because I want to know I have so much in my pocket when I go out to the store. And she goes, well, how do you know? And then, and I, 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 I just to tease her, I put my hand over to go, I can feel it. I can feel it. Yeah. She's smarter than me. So she said, then you should be able to feel how much I took, right? <laughs> but the fact is I could look at my money clip and know that something was taken out of it, Okay. I'm not going to explain how, how I know, because you'll go tell my wife, you guys. But th this, is, this is what you got to pay attention to. You know, if you're driving down the street in your car and you hear a weird noise, you don't ignore that, I hope. You know, um, my, I could be driving with my wife and she says, you know, why don't you check the, air the pressure in the, air in the tires? I go, why? She goes, it feels like one of the tires on my side might be a little bit low. I go, how do you do that? She goes, I don't know, but I, I just feel it. Sure enough, I could hit the sensor button on the dashboard and it goes, this one's two pounds or three pounds lower than the other ones. How does she know? I don't know. So you just got to know, you know, you, you got to pay attention to what's going on out there. Um, I've avoided more accidents by, by not hitting people <laughs> because I don't just pay attention to the person in front of me. I pay attention to the person in front of them. I'm always watching. I'm always watching. You know, and I'm always listening. I, I, I can't help it. I mean, I, I, that's how I was trained, with, especially with NLP. We call it situational awareness. So Absolutely. you got to learn to practice those things. You got to pay attention to the brain out your outside, 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 outside your brain, outside your head. Inside your head is nice. Outside your head, it's much more exciting. Trust me. Absolutely, John. And on behalf of everyone, in fact, if anybody wants to open up your mic and say thanks to John, I, I otherwise I'm just saying it. On behalf of everyone, John, we are really, really honored and privileged to have you with us. And we hope that we'll have uh, some time again in the future to, to, you know, to be with you uh, and, and share some words of wisdom from you. Um, uh, and on behalf of everyone, I think that's what everybody wants to They have been sending me messages to really thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for this lovely session, especially for the Pakistan people, because there's, there's never been done before. Uh, and because of this session, guys, I'm telling you, whatever my list price, I'm going to announce for the practitioner. Because of John here, you all will get 20% off straight away if you register in the next 24 hours. Wow. And that's that's my <laughs> generosity for you. I might sign up. I might <laughs> sign up. <laughs> well, uh, I want to especially thank... Uh, uh, thank you, John and uh, Muhammad Ali both. So thank you so much for bringing this opportunity for all of us. Thank you so much. John for giving us your precious time. Uh, it was indeed a great learning for all of us because there were many people who were not, uh, not clear that what is NLP and how they can use it practically, especially in our environment in Pakistan. 
So uh, your information, you so your discussion help us a lot. Thank you so much. Okay, good. I hope it helps everybody out there. I mean, a lot of country, different countries need all the help they can get. So. John, this is Ramzan, Definitely. the master practitioner of NLP. Uh, Kamran sir always appraised you in his all classes. And I'm very glad to see you here and hear uh, what you have said. So I really wish to have some time, uh, some meeting with you in USA, in Orlando sometimes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. thank you. I see Cameron. Cameron's in New Jersey at the moment. And uh, once in a while we have lunch. Yeah, yeah. He's now he's now left Pakistan, so I, he's left the you know the whole burden on me now to to live up to his shoes and your expectations and the <laughs> expectations of the people around me. <laughs> okay, great. This is great. I want to thank everybody yeah. again, and because uh, I really have to leave now, I have another appointment. Yes, so I do. I thank do have you to very leave. much, John. Okay, thank you very thank much, you guys. John. Okay, thank God you all, you. everybody. Bye. Grazie, grazie a presto. Okay, grazie, prego, prego. Ciao, ciao, John. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> Laura and Michela. And thanks, thanks to Mohammed. <laughs> thank you, Laura. Thank you, as thank always. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you very much. Welcome. And, and I'm sorry, I know a few people had some issues in coming in, but uh, I it's think okay. uh, there was some, uh, but you made it. I, I'm, 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 I'm the alter ego of Michela Manzoni today. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. I saw two Michelas. I was like, what is going on? Then I realized. Uh, and guys, since you are all here, John has already left us. But uh, if there is anything that you want to discuss, I am still available. Uh, we can have another five ten minutes. And as I said, that whatever my list price is, which is going to be announced uh, by the end of the session today, you will all. If you register by uh, today is twenty eighth. If you register by first of June, you will be getting twenty percent off straight away from the list price. So this is my you know my gift for your patience on uh, coming on and, and spending your time here with John. And this learning. Uh, if you have any questions, by the way, with me on the panel, you'll you'll be surprised. We have uh, Laura. She is a she's an amazing NLP uh, trainer from Italy. We have Michaela, who is also another NLP trainer from Italy. Uh, we had Stuart, who is a master trainer from Singapore, but he had to leave uh, with us. And uh, we had uh, Orlando, who is also another trainer, but he has uh, he's not there anymore at the moment. So, is there any questions? Um, please feel free. If not, then we'll have to end this uh, um, this Zoom call right now. Sure, Ibrahim, you can leave. I can appreciate. You can uh, you can uh, do on your work. So, thank you, Ramzan. Thank you, Sidra. Thank you, Farhan. Thank you, Hafiz Anwar. Thank you, Asad. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Laura, and thank you all of you guys. Kizar, Ashraf. Uh, thank you all of you, Dinar. Mutasim, Bajahat, Rehan uh, for attending this session and making it a great success. Thank you, Yasser. And uh, if I am missing any name uh, who is still there, uh, I apologize for it. Anyways, okay, guys. Thank you very much once again. And thank you, Sundas. Yes, I missed your name. Thank you, Sundas. <laughs> and uh, see oh, you guys Ali, soon. Thank you very much, grazie. Ali. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Bye.